So you may have calculated that today will be the end of our summer sermon series that we called Stepping Out, because summer, I'm mean, sorry, spring, because summer starts in a couple of days. And we've been on our mission here, this series called Stepping Out, and it's about doing the things that we are supposed to do to be the Christians that God intends us to be. So it's only fitting that today on Father's Day, I quote again one of my favorite local celebrities who was for quite some time a fixture on the show Stepping Out on WIS. It's my fraternity brother, Tom Fitzmorris, the local restaurant critic. And um, what he says about Father's Day actually seems to coincide a little bit with uh, the sermon title, uh, just don't, sta don't just stand there, don't just do something, stand there. I can hardly say it. Here's what Tom says about Father's Day. He says, on June 19, 1910, Father's Day was celebrated for the first time. The place was Spokane, Washington. It's only recently that Father's Day has become a serious dining day. This is because really, nobody cares about pleasing dad. If you forget Mother's Day, that's a capital offense. Forget Father's Day? Eh. He says, you should see the cards I got from my family yesterday, all of which were hilarious, but essentially insulting. If you know this guy, you can picture him saying this. I think the reason more people are taking their fathers and grandfathers out to dinner on that day is that the wives and kids want to go out, and Father's Day is a fitting pretext. I also believe that most fathers, given their true wishes, would stay home while everyone goes out, as long as, long as nobody tells him what to do for a change. Stay home, do nothing. You know, during our sermon series, we've had some really good naturally occurring events that... Uh, that helped us focus on stepping out, whether it was Memorial Day where we honored those men and women who gave their lives for our country, or it was two weeks ago at Pentecost Sunday where we saw the disciples uh, uh, deputized by the Holy Spirit to go out and start the Christian church. We forget sometimes, I think, that the fact that we're sitting in this Christian church like 2,000 years after that event with the Holy Spirit is not like an indirect result, but it's really a direct result of that deputizing by the Holy Spirit, as well as the result of the work of our brave soldiers and the work of the disciples in starting the church 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago even, that wasn't a small matter. It was recognized to be a big deal. Even in that chapter in Acts, you know, where the fire, the tongues of flame, where the Holy Spirit comes down upon the disciples, even in that same chapter 2, um, they talk about what an important event all this is. And that uh, chapter concludes this way, with Peter saying to people, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And then the scripture goes on. It says, those who accepted Peter's message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And then the believers, all the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And while they're doing all that, the Scripture says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, how about that first one, though? 3,000 in one day. On any given day, I would be happy to have three people converted. You know what? I'd be happy to have one person converted. There is no doubt what the dedication to the cause and the power of the Holy Spirit can do. But there's an aspect of what the disciples did that's important for us to recognize, and it's this. They waited. Jesus resurrected, told the disciples to wait, and that the time would come when the Holy Spirit would come to them, and they waited for the Holy Spirit, and it happened. That kind of waiting seems sort of foreign to us 21st century people, more often than not, we want to take action quickly, but seldom take time to figure out what the true meaning is of what it is that's before us and what we're really supposed to be doing. Most of our energy goes to what we're going to do, what shall we do? It's all about the life application part of it. There's very little patience and very low appetite to ask the meaning question. One Bible scholar pointed out that in that Acts 2 chapter, uh, he says that 23 of the verses of that chapter are dedicated to the concept of what does all of this mean? And that only three verses are dedicated to the second question of what shall we do? 
Now, that ought to be instructive to us. The Scripture and, the, and Jesus seem to suggest to us that it's important for us to get the meaning question right, and the what to do issue then will resolve itself, usually pretty quickly. One writer put it this way, he said, dig the well deep and the water will flow readily. That often requires us to be still, to assume a posture of standing there or maybe kneeling there to even begin to understand what God is doing in our lives and what that might mean. In our scripture today, Paul tells us, set your hearts on the things above where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You know, that's the same concept, setting our hearts on things above, that Jesus gives us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, when he says, seek first the kingdom of God. We're no longer to be seeking the things down here on earth, but are to set our hearts on the things of God, the things that will last forever, as opposed to the temporary things of this world. It's like Jesus told us in Matthew 6, and you know this scripture where he said, don't store for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in to steal them, but store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal them. For where your treasure is, so shall your heart be also. J.B. Lightfoot was born in 1828 in Liverpool, England. He was like one of the early Beatles of preaching, I guess coming from Liverpool. And he said it this way, he said, you must not only seek heaven, you must also think heaven. We've been raised with Jesus and therefore we're supposed to have a new focus. We're to be constantly thinking about God and the things of God rather than the things of earth. Now, to be clear, Paul in Colossians today and Jesus are not saying that all earthly things are bad and are to be avoided, but the problem is not in the things, but it's instead in the making the things your focus. The sin comes when the things and the world distract our attention and our affections away from Jesus. Let me say something that may give some of us pause. Paul is telling us in the scripture today, the little scripture we read, that we should want to do these things. We should desire to have our focus on heaven and not on earth. If what Paul is saying sounds awful to you, the Bible suggests there is a serious problem. If we do not want to listen to the things of God, sing about the things of God, read about the things of God, talk about the things of God, then Jesus is nothing to us. We have not been raised with him. Listening to, singing about, reading about, and talking about the things of God is the true basis for a Christian life. Scripture calls that walking with the Lord. Imagine if you were walking with God. You wouldn't be in a rush to do anything. You'd want to absorb every step of that walk and every piece of the conversation, absorb every precious moment. And I doubt that God would have to say it, but if he did, he would say, don't do anything. Just stand here with me. We all have things to act upon. I presume most of us have schedules for tomorrow or Tuesday that probably looks like wake up and get dressed and go to work, or if you work from home, then get right to work from home. I, I don't know that it's necessarily healthy for us to have any aspect of our life that functions so robotically, but for certain, our activities as Christians, whether it's becoming better Christians or raising up other Christians or helping people who are less fortunate than us, should not be so robotic because when we do 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 without pondering the depths of our faith and keeping our focus on heaven then what we do 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 starts to feel a whole lot like what Jesus warned against when the things we do are not done in his name no matter how charitable those acts may look like or feel Doing it like that equates to doing the things for our own self-promotion and not God's. 
For those of us who are fathers out there, remember what Jesus says in John 5, verse 19. He says, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son does also. Of course, Jesus was referring to his relationship with God, but I read this scripture for fathers as telling fathers that the example we set for our children needs to start with our relationship with God the Father, which means dads and everybody else out there today, if you aren't secure in your relationship with God, don't just do something, stand there, be still and immerse yourself in the things of God and the things of heaven. Let us pray. Lord, you give us abundant time to do all the works that you could ever call us to do, but Lord, in, in that abundant time, we also have time to sit and be still, to ponder on your word and the scripture, and to pray to you, and to be silent, and to listen to you. Help us, Lord, to have that discipline in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.